So enforcing versus ensuring. So we talked a little bit about this need for assessment, right? Like we're always measuring everything. And, you know, like uh, we have in, in business, this notion that it doesn't get measured. It doesn't get improved. School is all about measurement. Like work is all about measurement. And so we're always looking to do some type of measurement. But how do we measure their growth, like the problem with measurement is that it, it can be so discouraging. Like you, you get a bad evaluation, you feel like you can't do anything. How do we measure their growth in a way that also builds their confidence as, as a child? Like, yeah, sure, you want to improve. Maybe you made a choice at some point. This is what I want to learn. But how do you do like a measurement so that they, they feel encouraged, it builds their confidence as opposed to uh, like, I'm, I'm so inadequate because of this? I think I would really push back against this um, feeling that an adult needs to actually evaluate a child and measure a child's progress because, again, that's not consent-based. If somebody were to come into my room or into my house and start evaluating me on something that I don't even care about, um, like how, um, I don't know, <laughs> like how, how clean the counter, how clean my toilet is or whatever. Um, and they just come in and they give me a grade or whatever. It would just be so invasive because I'm not even asking for their input. That's not maybe even a priority for me at this point. So again, I think this, this need to evaluate and measure a child's progress is very adult centered it doesn't really have anything to do with our children and their desires, their goals, their interests. Um, there are ways to do it, of course, if our child is intrinsically motivated, they want to improve. So if I was just watching um, a documentary about Naomi Osaka, and if she's wanting to improve in her tennis skills, she will find a coach to do so. And that coach will give her helpful feedback and evaluation and ways to improve. But she has done so consensually. She has done so because she asked for that feedback. If that feedback was given to her without her consent, just because somebody walked by and wanted to comment on her, her abilities, that's just rude, right? It's, it's not helpful. It doesn't encourage them. So I think we need to go back to that basic thing where are we giving feedback consensually? Are they asking for it? Are they wanting to improve in their skills? Or is it, again, the desire of the parent to evaluate and measure and make sure that they are, you know, meeting certain standards that are honestly arbitrary um, and more focused on what the adult wants than the, than the child. So I think, yeah, we need to go back to the whole consent piece to me. I, I think that's so helpful, right? Like, because the way that you would evaluate versus the way that you would encourage would be two different things. And if you're like, for example, for, for my child, maybe all he needs is just the, the type of encouragement, like, because he's at a point where he, he knows that he's got some struggles, like he doesn't necessarily need an evaluation to tell him. Um, but by getting the type of encouragement that he did something well in the, like some area that he's interested in can be enough for him to motivate to go deeper and to try harder things by, by his own, like he, he'll kind of reach to that point. And it's kind of, it, it's tough to like go, I see you're kind of interested in this. Here's a roadmap of things that you need to do tomorrow, <laughs> you know, and I'm going to evaluate you on like level one, level two, level three, and, and then that's going to be your progress. But it's, it's more like getting to a point where they feel like they feel like it's a safe environment for them. Like, okay, yes, I, you know, when I make, when you make one of these, I'm going to go and share that with the grandparents. I'm going to go and you're going to get a ton of feedback from them. They're going to love it. Um, you know, is that something that you you would like to do? Because they've, they've been, they want to do that as well for you. And so they don't necessarily have a, mm, I would give it a five out of 10. Like the, the grandparents don't do that, right? Like they'll, they'll give you just like um, positive words of encouragement, which may be really what you need. And I, I remember saying this to my son, like, 
everything that you learn in school is like it's been done for hundreds of years, right? Like it's certainly possible to do. Uh, but really, the, the challenge at this point isn't your abilities. Like we know that you are able to do it. The question is, like, do you have the confidence, you know, to to get to that point? And if confidence is the thing that is missing for a lot of like kids because they're they're extremely capable of doing things, then what can we do to build up that confidence? Because like I've I've spoken to my own parents that are like, well, we just like sat you down and then we got you to do all those assignments. I'm like, yeah, that helped. Like it's like my own tiger parenting experience that may have helped, but it was really the point where you started. I started to realize that if it, if it, if I can figure out a way to relate it to creativity, like, which was something that I was very interested in, I can, I can make it work. Like I can, I will go and learn all of the hard things that need to be learned. No problem. It'll be easy for me. Um, versus if they sat me down, it, like it didn't really help. It was really the, the confidence that I could apply creativity to many other domains that really kind of stood out for myself. And I, I kind of wondered, you know, like maybe you've got similar experiences yourself, you know, because we're all we're all working against our <laughs> against the, the, the way that we were parented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely, you know, felt like just yeah, needing to grow in confidence. I feel like when I was a kid, the the type of affirmation that I got in school and my maybe my own personality, it really caused me to be afraid to fail. Actually, to be afraid to um, to be less confident or less risky in things that I felt like I could fail in because of that perfectionistic um, personality that I have, and because of the school mentality that reinforces there's a right answer and there's a wrong answer. If you get the wrong answer, you know, you get shamed or whatever. Um, so I think with our kids, if we want them to grow in confidence, part of that is they need to have a sense of choice. You know, if a, if a child feels helpless, if they feel like everything is just, um, they have no autonomy. They they don't have any power over their over their lives. They they internalize a sense of helplessness and depression because you know they don't have any choice in their lives. And and I think again, you know, our children are not. We are not meant to be all things to all people. We don't need to be good in everything. So how can we be confident and excited about the things that we are good at? so that we can dive fully into those things and know that we are each designed, created differently to contribute something different to the world. So we don't have to be good at this particular thing. I don't have to be good at math. <laughs> and I'm not. I'm horrible at math. Me neither. <laughs> but that, that doesn't mean that I need to apply all my energy to get good at math. I mean, if that was my desire, I could mm -hmm. do it. But maybe I can apply that energy and that creativity, that, that confidence to something else that I am really interested in, whether that's writing or, you know, sharing about unschooling or whatever. And to say yes, to have the freedom to say yes to those things that we really care about. I think that can help us gain confidence, that can help our kids gain confidence so they don't have to feel like they have to be all things to all people again. Like, even if they're not good at math, they're good at something else probably. <laughs> and and uh, to build confidence in that way instead of um, just boxing them in and labeling them because they don't fit traditional uh, labels of success or, you know, smarts and all that things. Like to me, I totally buy it. Like I, I love the approach. Um, but as somebody who is like so used to this world of like tiger parenting, um, I, I would love to ask like, well, well, how do we do that? Like, wh what is the what is the ways that you've tried that have have worked for you? Can you clarify like what do you mean exactly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we're talking about encouraging our children, right? Like we're talking about like we're not, our goal isn't to evaluate them, 
right? Because that means that we have a goal for them, right? And we have a set thing. But we do want to encourage them because encouragement, I feel, at the very least has to point to what you need to do next in order to improve. And that's something I, I refer to as well in the relating. So we like sedate, relate, create. So relating isn't just about like, oh, you're interested in these things. It was like, no, you're interested in these things. Hey, have you thought about like going and watch this video? Because this video is actually quite interesting. You might learn a little bit more about the topic that you're interested in. Um, and so at what point do we kind of encourage them to give them enough like uh, confidence and like a kind of a roadmap for, well, if, if you want to go further in here, you can go here. If you don't want to, that's okay too, but um, just something so you can be aware of. Yeah. So there's this um, this thing in the unschooling world that we call strewing. So strewing is when we um, are offering our kids a lot of different choices, things that we think they might be interested in, things that we feel like, oh, this is the next step that you could take. Um, and they get to choose. They get to consensually, in a self-directed way, choose whether or not to engage with those. So as parents, we can always be strewing. We can always be offering, inviting, encouraging. It just shouldn't be coercive. It shouldn't be like, I have the roadmap. This is the next step you, you have to take. It's always like, if you want to improve, here's something else. You know, Because as parents, as adults, we have more resources. We have more access to knowledge, to different resources that our kids don't know about. So it is important for us to be able to resource them and, and give them um, just open up their world more, but not to do it in a coercive, like, I know what's best for you type of way. So for example, um, with my, with my, one of my kids, um, he's really into digital art and drawing and there's like so many resources out there right now for like YouTube tutorials and all those things. And so, and there's classes. So I asked him, okay, if, do you want to take an out school class? Do you want to go and like learn from an art teacher, all those things? And he, he wasn't really interested at that point. You know, he's like, no, I'm fine. And for like months and months and months, he, you know, just continued drawing based on his, you know, what he already knew, just dabbled and played around. Um, and then it wasn't until more recently where he's been watching more you know, tutorials, um, just experimenting more with different eye shapes and like anime styles and stuff like that. So, I, but I had to wait for him to do it in his own time. Like I couldn't force it on him because if I forced it on him, then he would resent it and not, you know, perhaps lose interest. So part of it is like following their flow. Every child is going to be different. Um, their willingness, their their ambition, you know, every child is going to be different. And so how can we follow their lead, follow their flow, offer them what they want, but um, ultimately do it in just an encouraging partnership type of way instead of a coercive way. Uh, okay, so strewing is like, yes, it's offering many choices, but it's also combining that with the time, the patience that's needed for them to come and make their own decision. And it means that I can offer you 10 choices or I can offer you two choices, but you may choose nine, none of those and that's okay. Um, you may take longer. You may be like at the point where, okay, now, I need those eyes. I need to be able to, uh, as you described, like I need to be able to go in a little bit more detail for, for drawing. Okay, now I want to learn that stuff. And so it's just in time with what they wanted to learn. And nowadays that's like way easier. Like it's, it's easier than ever to do something like that. So it, like I, it's, I'm starting to, okay, strewing is starting to like make, it, it's starting to click a little bit uh, more for me. Um, now, the other thing that, um, you, we were talking about was, um, and it was like this perfectionism and parenting. And I was kind of curious about your perspective on this. Like if, if a lot of our perfectionism beca comes because we had a lot of pressure, um, as, as parents, like the, our parents put a lot of pressure on us. And as a result, like we're putting pressure on our own kids because we, we want them to perform. And we think that like, oh, we're going to feel so accomplished if, you know, our kids are, are like well accomplished. Um, but I think that this uh, this kind of leads to 
it, like it's not just an effect onto the on on the child, but it's also a, an effect on on the parent as well. And what have you noticed yourself when you have this ability to let go of perfectionism, let go of my child needs to perform like at a certain level, otherwise I won't feel like I'm I'm adequate as a parent. Um, I know for myself, I struggled with that a lot. It's like, well, no, like my child should be my pride. It should be like, it should be an extension of like how great I am. And it's like, what? <laughs> no, they're not. They're not an extension of you. They're, they're their own person. So like, how does letting go of perfectionism um, like change things as a parent? That has been huge for me and part of my own like untigering process, part of my own healing journey, because I, you know, really a lot of it had to be me untangling my identity and my worth from my performance, which when you grow up in like a tiger parenting household, you believe that your performance, like your, your belovedness, your worth, your value is based on your performance, um, how obedient you are, how well you do in school, you know, what level you are in, in the Suzuki level of piano or whatever it is, right? It's like um, we get affirmation and attention when we do well. And when we don't do well, we get yelled at, we get ignored, we get shamed, all those things. And so as parents, we definitely can bring that into our own parenting when we feel like we're failing as a parent, when we're, we're doing things that we don't want to do, when, when our relationship with our kids is fraught, when our kids aren't achieving at the level that we hope that they would. All that can trigger those feelings of shame, feelings of unworthiness and all those things. And so for me, just like healing my inner child, going back and and reparenting myself so that I know that no matter my performance as a parent, even uh, no matter my behavior, that I am unconditionally loved. That is huge. That is huge. And when I can like offer that more to myself, show empathy and patience to myself, even in those times when I'm throwing a tantrum, when I'm dysregulated and um, angry and upset and I have big emotions, the more I can offer um, that grace, that empathy and compassion to myself, um, the more I have found that I am able to offer it to my children when they behave in the same ways. So I think that releasing of perfectionism has been huge in my own untigering journey. Uh, I absolutely uh, love that. And if you don't mind, like I, I wrote something down, this this kind of, there's a, a certain piece uh, to imperfect parenting. If you become okay with parenting that is not perfect all the time, and it doesn't need to be, um, you also at the same time feels like you 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 build your own confidence as as a parent. And I wonder if perfectionism is really a mask for anxiety that we have as like we feel like we're we feel a, a type of inadequacy, right? In in our own parenting. That's why we we strive so hard for like this notion of perfect parenting, because we feel like, oh, if I did this, like I, I would be I'd be killing it, you know, like I, I would be doing so well, but it's like, no, like even if you had those things, even let, let's say your child did, like, would it really address your anxiety? It's like, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> it's like, oh, I've got to, I've got to cook something special for my kid every day. <laughs> Otherwise, like they're going to starve to death. It's uh, no, no, they're not. They're not going to starve to death. Like, um, but it's, it's tough because you have a strong expectation that like, maybe I, I expect that I'm, I'm, I cook food that they're going to eat and, you know, eat every time. And it's like, no, it, it's not going to be like that. And I think you know, that's, that's a tough one, right? Like I, I remember you like crying sessions, <laughs> you know, with, with my, uh, my wife, it's just like, this is, this is not easy. This is not easy. And um, I've often said like, you can't compare to what your parents went through. Like they didn't go through a pandemic while having young kids, having to learn and teach online, while also working at the same time, like all of the things that we have to do today, there aren't other 
like adults, like grandparents that are going to really sympathize and understand your situation. And yes, they're, they're like recognizing that what advice they gave you is advice that they were given from their grandparents or their parents um, also is a, a really good uh, like sense of like, yeah, like they had their own anxieties. They had their own hesitations. It, it, like, is this, am I on the right track here? Like, am I, am I, does it feel like I'm catching on to what you're, you're saying about the imperfect parenting side? Mm-hmm. I love what you said about how um, perfectionism is probably rooted in fear and anxiety, you know, about our own vulnerabilities and inadequacies, feelings of inadequacy. And so that desire to like project this image to be perfect, to have everything together, you know, is really out of fear. And I think when we recognize that we can really have compassion for it, compassion for our parents who, you know, maybe did that (laughs) to us growing up. And when we feel that way with our, with our children, um, I know I wrote in my book that, that motherhood was ruining my straight A reputation, right? Like I, I felt like I had life together and then all of a sudden these children of mine were not following the script and I felt out of control and I felt it really triggered things in me when I, I couldn't control them, when I thought I was doing everything right and they were not falling in line. And so it does bring up a lot of fears in us. So how can we notice that, pay attention to it, be gentle with ourselves in that? So you mentioned control um, and it, it kind of, it, that being out of control uh, like, for example, like with the kids, for example, that being out of control as a trigger uh, for a lot of the anxieties that you had as, as a straight A parent. And I was wondering if you could uh, expand a little bit more on this notion of control and out of control, because I I found the same as well. Like it, it was very hard to let go of um, the, the control of their like of the child and of their behavior and to start to embrace, like I was spending so much time like focused on their behavior, which I couldn't control at all. And I was spending no time on the environment that they live in. Right. And just saying like, you know what, I could change that environment. Okay. I don't like him like opening up the pantry and then like, you know, getting all the chocolates in the morning. Well, then I'm going to lock, put a lock on the, on the pantry so that they can't do that. I can control the environment. I cannot control him, but uh, I can make it easier for him to, you know, uh, uh, to not, uh, say consume all the chocolate in the morning, um, and then we we run into this like big yelling match in the morning because I'm going to lose self control. I'm not going to be able to handle it. Um, so can you like it, help us understand like how do we how do we separate those those aspects of control? How do we feel comfortable with the control that we do have and the control that we do not have? Mm. So I think you know the first thing is just to debunk the myth that we can control another person. (laughs) We can barely control ourselves, you know? So it isn't our job to control our children, right? It is our job to be able to regulate and self-control ourselves, like to control the words that come out of our mouths, to control our reactions. It's not even our job to control our emotions or our thoughts. I think just to allow those to come, but to control how we respond to those. So it's really important for us to have the freedom to feel whatever we feel or to think whatever we're going to think, but then to take a step back and to notice it, to, to give it space, be aware of it, and then to mindfully choose how to react, how to respond, what, how we're going to act on that, you know? Um, so to resist control, the the false belief that we can control somebody else, to be able to control ourselves, work on controlling ourselves and our reactions. And then, like you said, controlling the environment Um, because it's unrealistic for us to expect certain behaviors for our children who perhaps are very young and still learning. So we don't want to um, expose them to temptation and then expect them to just not do those things because we told them not to, you know, whether it's getting into the chocolate or whatever it is. 
so we are can be responsible for um, creating an environment that is safe for them, where you know they can have freedom within that environment. Um, it, there's limits and safe boundaries for them. So yeah, I think those are my thoughts about about control. I love that so much because it, you're right. Like you, you, there's a lot of this notion of controlling other people, which makes no sense, right? Like we're not there to control other people, but there are some things that we can try to control. We can control how we react to different situations, which is not easy. I mean, this is a skill, like don't expect perfection there. And then we can also control our environment. Like, so we, we say like, it, it's hard as, uh, for us as adults, you know, to control uh, outside of our own environment. And if we don't go and do something about the environment, like we will have hard times. So for like for our kids, it, it like it, we're not setting them up for success. So you don't want that like change, change that environment and find a way to, to do it differently. And so I think that that was a like a really strong realization is that we, we put so much um, response, like when we're so heavily involved, like we, we talked about like on this notion of like the tiger parent who is like heavily controlling everything in that kind of situation, especially when it comes to like the behavior, the results and the performance of your child become your responsibility. And you can have a lot of anxiety around, oh, if they don't perform, then it's your fault. It is not their fault. They don't feel responsible that, oh, okay, well, I didn't, I didn't perform. And um, I think, yeah, I, like, I, I'm also very curious, like what, what, like their, like, what does, Hey, I'm I'm comfortable with you taking control. Like, what does um, giving back that can like taking away the need to control things? Uh, what does that do in terms of like our comfort on the results? Um, for example, they don't hand in their homework. You know, they fail the assignment. They, uh, you know, they don't perform well in in their in their schooling. Um, how? What do we do in that kind of situation? Like, how does it feel? Um, maybe you can describe that from your experience, because I'm very new <laughs> at just learning about unschooling and untigering uh, from, from that perspective. Sure. So I feel like um, a lot of it is us parents needing to work through our own fears and our own ego. <laughs> so... You know, sometimes we try to step in and save our children from pain, save them from the consequences of their actions, um, because we're uncomfortable with it. We're uncomfortable with seeing them in pain, with um, having them experience negative consequences. And I think as parents, we need to develop resilience in that area where we need to give them the space to make mistakes because that is a huge learning opportunity for them. If we're always the one on the outside telling them what's wrong um, and then controlling their behavior so that they never choose what's wrong, they will never really learn about cause and effect. They will never learn about the natural consequences of making certain decisions. And so we need to really um, allow them the opportunity to make choices to make decisions and to make bad decisions. You know, sometimes when I talk about um, giving our children more autonomy, we still want to control the results in some way. Well, how can I give them autonomy, but still make sure that they will turn out well or that they will do the right thing? And we can't. That's the whole thing about it. It's, it's like they have agency as a, a human being who will make good choices and bad choices. And But what we can do as parents is to um, step back and to sometimes allow them to make the bad choice and experience the negative results of that bad choice, but then always be there, always empathetic. Like, you know, we're not going to say, I told you so, you know, if you had only listened to me, you wouldn't, you know, this wouldn't have happened. You know, that's never helpful because then we're pitting ourselves against our children again. You know, we become their enemies. How can we always be on their side where they know that we always have their back, even if they make mistakes, you know, part of, part of 
growing up and becoming an adult and and um, all that is is having the freedom to live your life and make mistakes and learn from them. And I think the responsibility for us as parents is to be available um, to give advice. We can always give advice and and give our input and share the wisdom that we have based on our years of experience. But ultimately, a lot of these things, they have to choose for themselves. That's a really great point. Like they're going to make mistakes and it's really important. Like when would you like them, like in what environment would you like them to make mistakes? Would you like them to make it when they're adults, you know, and they're the consequences and maybe you're not around to, to give them the support that they need? Or would you like them to make mistakes now when if they make a mistake, like you can be there to support them and, and work through like, yeah, like this is going to be okay. You're going to be able to work through this. Um, I'm here to help you. And so it gives them the sense that like the this fear and anxiety around mistakes is because like maybe we didn't make mistakes until like much, much later in our own lives. And then we started to like not know what to do and not know how to cope. I mean, that's another skill as well. It's just being able to recognize that making mistakes is just part of the process. You just need, you need room, you need room for mistakes. I love mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Kids learn how to make decisions by making decisions. <laughs> so let's yeah, help them. It seems let's, so obvious. <laughs> let's support but them. It's, in... it's hard to do in practice. Yeah, yeah. it is. It is. <laughs>